My um, work really starts always within communities. <clears throat> and the book Radical Help starts in the same way. And it starts, well, it tells really stories of people in Britain, in all parts of Britain, people I've been working with over the last 10 years. And a lot of those people are facing kind of deep challenges. So the book I don't think is depressing, but as like one of the mums says to me, if you don't know what your problems really are, then you can't start to solve them. And I suppose in the same way, I think if we don't kind of root ourselves in people's lives and live alongside people, it's very hard for us to know kind of as a nation where we should be going. So I tell stories of people like Stan, who is an older man who lives, he's in his 80s, he lives very close to here. And when I go to his flat, you can kind of hear the noise of the traffic. You can see the cafe, if you peer out of his window. He's close to libraries, theatres and everything else. But he is utterly cut off. And when I meet Stan, about once a week, the carer of his sheltered housing comes around. And sometimes his grandson calls from uh, Canada. But that's really the only social connection he has. Um, I work with mothers like Ella. When I meet Ella, she, like, actually pretty much all the mothers I have has two mobile phones. One is to manage what she calls the social, the welfare state, that she is absolutely terrified will take her children away. And the other is for the very small uh, group of friends and family she's got who she trusts. And when I meet Ella, there have been 73 different uh, professionals, if you like, in her life, social workers, police, housing officers, none of them have made any difference to the kind of very complex troubles her family faces. And she just wants the welfare state to walk away. She doesn't want any kind of, she just wants them to go. And then the other side of that is that I also work um, alongside uh, frontline, it's interesting that we call it frontline, but frontline professionals, social workers like Ryan, for instance, who um, has to work with Ella's 14-year-old son, and he's also pretty dispirited. It's very difficult to work. I don't know who here kind of works within the welfare state, but it's a very, very difficult place to work. And day after day, people do brilliant work, but I think largely despite the kind of systems that they're part of. And originally, I think I was told I wasn't allowed to talk about suicide, but I mean, I think originally there was something about loneliness and suicide, and I can't remember what else around this talk. And I think that, you know, people who are kind of loneliness in despair... And actually also, I mean, the biggest occupational group who commit suicide in Britain every year are women nurses. I mean, it's a stressful place to work. So that's kind of the challenges. And, I mean, my kind of thesis really is that the welfare state, which was once so brilliant, is completely out of kilter with our lives. And in Radical Help, I kind of say that this is for three reasons. And the first is that we face a whole series of new challenges which weren't really thought of when the welfare state was designed. So issues like loneliness. I mean, we could say, what shall we do with Stan? He's lonely. We could have a minister for loneliness and we could send a service in. But actually, that isn't what he wants. What he says he wants is to hear a little bit of the music he loves, kind of big band music, uh, Fred, Fred Astaire, Sinatra, that kind of thing. And he wants to hear it with other people who actually really like that music. So we could, anyway, we could kind of think about those problems, things like loneliness, chronic conditions, which I think, you know, now kind of the biggest health challenges we face. One in four of us have a chronic condition, but our health services weren't designed for that, living on a fragile planet. And what I think matters is that not just that these problems weren't thought of when the welfare state was designed, but actually they're really different in nature. So what we have is we have these kind of very vertical industrial command and control services, you know, very kind of power travels up and down at this hierarchy. And we have these challenges which are all about participation, like kind of to confront climate change, to live well with chronic conditions. We need to get involved. We need kind of very new horizontal systems that do include professionals, but also peers, family, that involve us. And yet our welfare state really is designed to manage us keep us at arm's length and keep us out. And in fact, because I work in a kind of very ethnographic way, in all the services I work alongside, I see how 80% of resource is usually spent managing the queue, filling out the forms. It's not actually spent on any kind of real change. So that's problem number one. Problem number two is kind of the deep socioeconomic change. This is not the world of the 1950s. I could talk about that a lot. But one of the biggest things is that our services still silently assume that women unpaid will do the work of care. And Beveridge never knew what to do about this. He couldn't confront the challenges of care, so he sort of swept it behind the front door and said, women will do that. Women will care for our very young children, elderly parents, <coughs> neighbours if necessary. And, of course, that started to break down in the 1960s. The introduction of the market has kind of made it even worse. I'll come back to that. But this is a challenge that's been around for a long time and we need to think really radically about. And then the third is poverty. 
Again, the founders of the welfare state thought that poverty would be solved. It hasn't been. It's back. We've got deep inequality. Some of this is kind of traditional, a lack of money, low paid work. Some of it is new. Beveridge would have been astonished to kind of see so much in work poverty. And then also I make an argument based on kind of a lot of social research that poverty today is also defined by relationships. Basically, um, the work, for instance, of Mike Savage at the LSE. Am I allowed to mention the LSE? You definitely. Yeah, I'll only mention it once. It's done definitely. now. Um, it basically shows that your life is determined <coughs> according to who you know, what kind of work you'll find, whether you progress in that work, what kind of health care you'll receive, who will take care of you in the end. All of that depends on a network of relationships and a very diverse network of relationships. And, of course, those of us who most need that diverse network are those who are least likely to have it. So these are kind of challenges that the traditional welfare state can't even see, I think, let alone confront. So the question is, what should we do? And I think what we need to do is go back to the original vision of the welfare state, which was about how all of us were going to flourish as a nation. It wasn't about the provision of good services and meeting outputs and outcomes and all the rest of it. It was about flourishing. And then, of course, we needed services because you can't flourish if you don't have good housing and if you don't have good education and so on. But what really mattered was this vision and something that we were all part of. And so in Radical Health, I talk about how we could actually kind of reinvent that vision for today, based on the resources we have today, to kind of take care of us cradle to grave. So I look at how we can provide stand music, and we just connect people up on the phone who like the same music and they listen to music together, and actually through that, Stan gets back his confidence and he starts to go out. With Ella, we say, okay, so there have been 73 professionals in your life involved so far. What would happen if everybody stood back and we thought again, I mean, very much to take back control, what would happen if we asked Ella to find her own way out? And that's what we did. And so we said to the mothers, why don't you recruit a team? We don't expect you to change your lives on your own. You need support. But why don't you decide how you would like to make change? And then we kind of interviewed um, existing professionals, social workers, health officers, and so on, and formed new teams. But the balance of power had really shifted because those new teams were to support Ella and other mothers with what they wanted to do. So I tell those stories. Work. I mean, work was absolutely core to the welfare state. Um, the idea was that you would be temporarily out of work, and if you, um, you know, if, if that happened to you, you would kind of go and you'd join a queue, you'd get some benefits, and you'd get advice to keep a job. And actually, the services we have today are absolutely identical. I mean, obviously, the benefits have been reduced. There are computers on the desks. But fundamentally, if you're out of work in this kind of fourth, fifth industrial revolution, you go and you join a queue that was designed in the 1940s and it doesn't work. So we asked everybody who didn't like that approach to come through a door. We put up a fake door in a job centre. We said, this isn't working. We asked everybody to give us kind of five pounds if they want to come through. In fact, we had to keep raising the price by the hour because so people wanted to come through, which is obviously people do want to kind of work in a different way and don't want to be kind of locked in, in, in systems like this. And then we asked everybody to help us invent a new way forward. And so actually what we did was we invented something called Backland, which is a community of people in work and <coughs> work in between. So the work is always very collaborative, and it's always about bringing people from very different parts of society and communities together. And then instead of asking people how long they've been out of work, or you know, what their skills were, what their qualifications were, we said to everybody, what do you dream of? And do you know the person that can help you make that dream a reality and take the first step? And if you don't, we'll help connect you. And a randomised controlled trial of our service shows that it costs one-fifth, that it gets kind of over 60% of people into work, including those, that's a measurement for those traditionally what the DWP would call far from the labour market. 87% of people progress in work and 100% grow capability. So this is a vision based on collaboration and basically growing capability. So it's a kind of complete shift in power, which doesn't say, how can I fix you, what's your need, but how can I work alongside you to grow the core capabilities that we need to flourish in this century? And I think, you know, that what I would say, really, to the question about taking back control is that I'm not sure it's about taking back control, or at least it's kind of slightly different to that. Because actually, Beveridge, the architect of the welfare state, wrote the first very famous report, the blueprint for the welfare state, which was translated into kind of how many languages and kind of was a bestseller and sold out. But he then, he wrote a second report on work, and then he wrote a third one on voluntary action. And in the third report, which was very little read, he basically said that he had made a terrible mistake. And that in his original settlement, he had left out people, he left out communities, and he left out the relationships between people. And he said that this is extremely damaging 
It's limiting creativity, but it's also forcing people to see themselves within certain categories in order to receive help. And that we've made a kind of really dreadful mistake. And of course, well, it wasn't well read. I mean, I can talk about, you know, all kinds of reasons why that was the case. Um, but basically, he recognises fatal flaw that there was a lack of relationships in the heart of the welfare state. And then I think that what's happened is that with the kind of you know, neoliberal reforms of that original settlement, things have actually got much worse because you know, that's kind of intensified this kind of distance with all these sort of things about actually, you know, the provider on one side and all the kind of commissioning frameworks. So you know, we've got to a state where kind of seeing the same doctor is something we can't really value, where kind of asking communities to come together and, and giving them the resource to sort problems and to kind of create new forms of support is very complicated because you know, well, we can't commission that, we can't kind of have a competition around that. So things that were already there have definitely intensified. And I think what we need is a new framework and a new architecture and really a new role for the state. Um, and so kind of in the book, I talk about the kind of six core things, the framework that we would need um, and how we could grow that through kind of new economies of cooperation and what the role of the state would be in kind of investing in that framework, investing in new forms of innovation. And also, I think, modelling new forms of behaviour, not modelling kind of forms of the market, but modelling a different form public leadership. And so I think just to kind of wrap up, one of the things I think through my work is that the kind of work I'm describing and the stories I tell in the book, with you know, which are stories of, of new <coughs> forms of support that thousands of people have used, that this work is actually all around us. And actually probably I'd be really interesting, but I'm sure that many of you have come here this evening because you're doing this kind of work. But the problem at the moment is that this work is on the margins and it's on the outside of our systems. It's really hard to get funding for, it's really hard to do over time because it doesn't fit traditional measurement systems, it certainly doesn't fit a kind of market view of the world. Um, and so it's very, very hard really to take care of everyone. And so what we really need is a kind of new framework that moves everything that is so vibrant but on the margins into the centre. And that would be, I wouldn't call it take back control, but that would be the future that I think would take care of everybody. <laughs>